And we're studying uh, the nature of a question that has, of course, been a very serious concern to all of us all of our lives. And that is, what happens after the human body can no longer hold that which is the life force? Where do we go? Uh, what happens to us? And when you get involved in that subject, then you have to start you know, really um, addressing all of the other things that surround you. Nature, uh, what goes on in the universe, what goes on on the earth. You have to look at scriptures to see what do they say. You have to look at philosophies. One of the prime philosophies that's a part of this is called karma. And it's an extremely misunderstood philosophy. And as you, as you start to look at the things that Al uh, posts on here on television, didn't see what Al was talking about earlier. There, an article in Discovery Magazine which shows the impact of genetics and so forth on, on the behavior that we all take part in. And then, of course, the philosophies that abound that we have to come back to work out our karma. And then we start to find out when we look at stories such as this that our karma is really not our karma at all, but it belongs to somebody else who deposited in us. Uh, like we're, we're like a, a bank or a depository for other people's chromosomes. And uh, they pile into us, and, uh, and, and here we are. We say, why do you do this? There's a, um, I don't know what page it's on, but if you ever want to see Al, what you were talking about in the Discovery Magazine, if you look at Romans, in the book of Romans, and if you look at Romans chapter um, 7, um, what, I don't know what page that's on in those little Bibles. Maybe somebody could uh, say, uh, let me know. Page 923. Page 923. Thank you. Um, but in this, uh, the, the person who wrote the Bible in here, I guess Paul or Saul or whoever, he says in verse 15, and I think all this adds up to exactly what you were talking about with genetics. For that which, verse 15, chapter 7, for that which I do, I allow not. In other words, the things that I'm doing, I'm telling other people, don't do that. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, in other words, the things that I should do, I do not. But what I hate, that's what I do. That's the guy that wrote the Bible, and you wonder why we're screwed up, and look where he's coming from. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? So what he's saying there, and he didn't have the luxury of a Discovery magazine that explains how genetics do all of these things. He's trying to figure out why does he act this way? And his answer is, I, I don't know. But he's come up with an answer. And this is the ultimate cop-out of a biblical writer. In verse 17, now then, it is no more I that's doing this stuff, but sin that dwells in me. That devil made me do it. <laughs> Geraldine, remember that? The devil made me do it. But basically, that's exactly what he's saying. It's not me that's doing this scuzzy stuff, so don't look at me. Well, then how can you send somebody to hell? How can you say to somebody, well, you, you know, or how are you going to work out your karma if you didn't do this in the first place? You didn't have anything to do with this. Okay. So then he says in verse 19, for the good that I would, and the, the good things that I would really like to do, I don't do them, but the evil which I shouldn't do, that's what I do. Did you hear about Marv Alpert? The, uh, Marv Alpert was one of the unfortunate people who sat in a courtroom and had everybody read his thoughts publicly. Who could sit there? Who could sit there? A man who wants to make some of the invisible strings visible. Yeah. Well, I don't know if uh, they're to be gotten rid of. Uh, I, I would dare say that nobody, including the judge, could have sat in Marv Albert's chair and had his uh, secret places exposed. And he says, in verse 20 again, he says, Now, if I do that, I would not. In other words, if I do the things I shouldn't do, it's no more I, but the sin that dwells in me. So he says then, in verse 23, I see another law in my members, in other words, my body, warring against the law of my mind. 
against the light which is there, and bringing me into captivity to the law of seven, which is in my memory. So in other words, here's the guy who wrote the Bible, he was telling you what to do, and who, you know, they sang songs and everything, saying he's all screwed up. Here is a guy who is running around, writing the Bible with one hand, and wearing women's clothes uh, in another hand, and hiding out from a And who knows what he's doing? Who knows? Who knows this? And who cares? It's at, at beautiful. That's one of the pro most profound statements. Who cares? Whose business is it? But you know what's good about it? He's, he admits it. Now, now that I've told you this, that I'm really a jerk and I do worse things than you, here's what I'm going to tell you not to do. <laughs> Don't do this because I know you're going to do it anyhow. Okay. Last week, it was interesting. We had a uh, kind of get-together about <coughs> the factors that contribute to consciousness in, in some ways of what I was saying that book was talking about. We had Rich sit up here and he uh, actually portrayed the light inside of the fetus in the womb. And then we had one person get up representing genetics and another person representing the parents and the family, another person church and religion, friends, school, job, social order, and God consciousness. And everybody stood around and then as Al Vero stood here and he was the still small voice talking to the person and saying, listen to me and everything's going to be all right, everybody started yelling out and screaming at the same time and showing that it's impossible for you to hear God unless you forcibly through meditation shut these voices down. Because here you are as an angle of light inside of a fetus developing into a human being, you enter as an angle of light, which you know as an angel of light, and here you are in the middle of this. And you have, you're like somebody that's moving into, you know, a rented place. You have no control over what's going on in here. And all of these things start happening, and they're all earthly, and they affect what goes on, and most of the times the angle of light succumbs to all of the screaming and yelling and, 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 it, and, it, and, it, and it can't function. And then at the point of physical death, the angle of light leaves and rejoins its source. All things seek back to their source, whether it be fire seeks its source, water seeks its source, everything seeks back to its source, and light seeks back to its source, which you are. So here then we find out that the creation of each one of us has nothing to do with God. That we are created, one, by genetics, and then all of the other things we're subjected to from church and school and all the rest of it. And we wind up being the people that we are, not because God had anything whatsoever to do with it, but because we are the creatures of the earth put together by the kings of the earth, which are the thoughts of the mind. If your parents are black, you're going to be black. If your parents are a cat, you're going to be a cat. You'll pick up patterns, you'll pick up physical things, all because of what? Not simply because of your parents, but dating back thousands of years. Everybody that intercoursed with everybody else, and each time they drop chromosomes in, and all the chromosomes get mixed up, and then finally it came to be your turn, and you're picking up all of this stuff from Uncle Louis, who might have been a rapist back in London, and Sarah, who God knows what she was into, she might have run a brothel in Turkey, for all you know. But her chromosomes are being dumped in you, and then you wonder, geez, I don't know why I feel this way. Well, certainly you feel this way. You've got all these screwballs laying eggs inside of you. But the point is, that's not only <coughs> funny, and it's not only curious, but it's a provable fact. And that's what you are. So when we start to understand that, it gets very good because then we start to realize that at the point of death, we leave this thing in much the same way as somebody gets their going home letters from Vietnam, hey, I'm out of here, and, and, and you return back to your true family to that point of light, not, not, well, there's nothing you can do. And, and so then you say, well, what was my purpose? Why was I put inside of this insane asylum? I had nothing to do with all of this. I don't know about Uncle Louie and his problems, or Aunt Sarah and her problems, or all of these people who for hundreds or thousands of years have been contributing chromosomes, and finally I wind up getting a combination of all of this stuff, and I can't deal with it. For what purpose? And then we start to understand what the purpose is. We understand that the only purpose that we have is to wipe all of this out.
to destroy it all. You've come to destroy. That's why Jesus says, I am not come to bring peace but a sword. Because you don't come here to coexist with all this insanity. You come here to destroy it. And you destroy it by breaking down the patterns and breaking down the thought patterns. That's why you're sitting in here. Whether you realize it or not, you're sitting in the midst of a revolution. And, you're, and your, your, your whole idea, your whole reason for existing is to break down. And you do it by meditation. And you break down by understanding and changing of living habits and changing of beliefs. You start breaking down a whole thing that has been accumulating for thousands of years. And then you get to that point when you finally are shutting down what the school says, what the job says, what the church says, what, what, what family says, and all of these traditional patterns, finally you shut them all down and you can start to hear that still small voice. In 1 Kings 9, 19, 11, it said, and, and, and the, the strong wind rent the, and break the rocks in pieces, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, and the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And you know that you cannot possibly hear the still, small voice if everything is screaming at you, as it does scream at all of us every day of our lives. Every day that you get up, something's screaming at you. One place or another, something's screaming at you. And, 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 and that's all you can hear. And you're trying to project. And then you're trying to go to the doctor to keep yourself well. And you're taking cold tablets. And you're taking medicine. And you're taking tranquilizers. And it's a losing battle. Because eventually, it wins. You lose. No matter what. You can't win. But see, finally, when you rise in this meditative process that we teach, Finally, when you rise to that point, you come to the point of the hippocampus of the brain where you start to send the electrical energy through ohm up through the spine. And at the hippocampus of the brain is Amon's horn. And Amon's horn is the ram's horn. And when the ram's horn is blown, it causes the wall to fall down, which blocks you away from that which is the true communion with what we call God. That's why the shofar, S-H-O-F-I-R, the ram's horn is blown at Yom Kippur. Because Yom Kippur is the time of enlightenment, the time of atonement. The ram's horn, do you think, I mean, this is, this is like sticking your head in water and making God turn, I mean, do you think God really gets turned on because somebody stands there with a horn off of a sheep and blows through it? I mean, what is this? Boy, that's great, I'm turned on, I'm going to save everybody, blow it again. Oh, I love it. What is this? But that's what we're, that's where we're at. I love to hear it. I love to hear it in the midst of a desert. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Well, that's where most of us are in the midst of a desert. And that's where we do it. The ram's horn is not in the midst of the desert. The ram's horn is in the midst of your brain. It's in the hippocampus of your brain. When you activate that, you're activating the God part of the brain that causes things to happen, that causes you to become enlightened. That's the only reason the ram's horn is blown at the shofar at Yom Kippur, and that's the reason the ram's horn was blown for the wall to come down in Jericho, because if you go to Jericho, you find out, quite to the chagrin of many religious people, the wall never did fall down. So then we think here, you know, once again, are we creatures of God? Are we creations of God? Two people. You have your mother and you have your father. And those two people come together in sexual intercourse. And when they come together in sexual intercourse, mom deposits 23 chromosomes from her egg and dad deposits 23 chromosomes from his sperm. And those 46 chromosomes get together and lo and behold, out comes you, a little <laughs> nitwit with purple hair. Going, I'm okay, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Sure you are, look at you, you're nuts. You're going to cause everybody all, but that's what comes out. And most of you at one time or another have done that. You've, sh you've let your chromosomes go flying, and the other guy let his, and this is what you got. And then you went around for about 20 years trying to be having a breakdown, taking pills, and say, how am I going to overcome this thing? Because this thing is going to get bigger. <laughs> 
bigger and stronger. So. <laughs> and each one of us, you know, <laughs> at one time or another, each one of us were there, you know, doing all of these terrible things that you do when you got purple hair and you're going like that. <laughs> so you have 46 chromosomes. Now, the chromosome, and the word is spelled C H R O M O S O M E. The chromosome is a tiny structure which is a blueprint. Okay? The reason you look the way you do and act the way you do, feel the way you do, and are the way you are, is because of chromosome. That's the reason. Okay? The chromosome uh, brings all the characteristics of what you're going to look like, what color skin, color eyes, color hair, size of your nose, physical traits, and mental ability. It's in here, the chromosome. That's why some people, and I'm not, I don't mean this to be funny, or slow. It's not because that individual person is a dope. It's because of years of mom's chromosomes and dad's chromosomes. Remember, mom got hers from somebody else. Mom got her chromosomes from another mom and dad. And dad got his from another mom and dad. And they got theirs and on and on and on. And they wind their way down. And then you're the receptacle of all of this stuff. And, and it can be, you know, in other words, it, you know, it's a very profound thing. Just look at yourself. I mean, you, you look at yourself in a mirror and, you know, your existence is so treasured, so valuable, so important to you. If your mom and your dad did not have sexual intercourse and contribute 46 chromosomes, you would never exist in the history of the world. You could never exist. No other two people could ever put together the chromosomes in the pattern that made you. It's impossible. It doesn't make any difference how many skillions and billions of people got together. You could never exist. You would never have existed in the history of the world. Wonder if, for instance, wonder if, for instance, mom isn't married. And wonder if this guy comes over and they have a few drinks and put some quiet music on. <laughs> you know. And they retire to the well, they retire to the boudoir. <laughs> and they get a little bit. And mom said, Are you wearing a uh, and dad says Oh, I knew I forgot something. <laughs> On we go. You are not the result of the creation of God. You are the creation of someone who forgot to go to the right aid. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is. Or well, let's say, Mom is practicing the rhythm method. <laughs> With the rhythm method, you have to know how to add. <laughs> Mom's not good at arithmetic. <laughs> and so since mom's not good at arithmetic, here you are. God had nothing to do with this. She just wasn't paying attention in school. Sorry. But if your see. Now, let's say your mom decides at the last minute she doesn't want to marry dad. And mom goes over and marries some other guy. You can't possibly be born. Because it is the combination here that make you, not the combination here. It's not possible for you to be born. Dad goes off and he marries some other woman. You can't possibly be one. The only possibility that exists in the universe for you to be on this planet if these two get together. Otherwise, you're not going to be here. So that makes it very, very interesting. The reason it's so interesting is because what this proves, I mean, can you imagine that you could be a creation of somebody forgetting to go to the drugstore? Is this what God's plan is? 
He's going to make the guy forget to go to the drugstore? I mean, so what this proves then is the entire process of you being on this earth and then being a Christian or a Jew or whatever you are and looking the way you do and acting the way you do absolutely is totally controlled by people. There is absolutely no involvement of any God in here at all. It's totally between people deciding. And remember, we talked about mom and dad, and maybe dad didn't go to the drugstore, or maybe mom didn't practice the rhythm method, or didn't add right, and all these things are funny and so forth, but this is just mom and dad. We've had generations and generations before them depositing chromosomes. All kinds of crazy stuff. Did you ever hang here? Sometimes you see somebody in a family, and everybody looks uh, pretty much the same except one person. <laughs> you, know, you don't look like I, you don't look, of course not, where did this one come from? God knows. Right. And, and so all of these mean it depends on who meets who, who changes whose mind. But yet, in spite of all of this craziness, now just think of what we've talked about and laughed about here. A person could be born because somebody forgot to go to the drugstore. A person could be born because somebody didn't add properly. A person could be born because they decided to do this, or a person could be born because they decided not to. I mean, all of these things that are totally dependent on us, and yet there is a scripture. And the scripture is on page 623. And now we start to move to the point where we start to understand who we really are. Because we're not an accident of a drugstore or somebody adding two and two. On page 623, in the book of Jeremiah, it says in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, Before I formed you in the belly, in the womb, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. In other words, before I formed you inside of that fetus, I knew you. Knew who? Say. Knew what? Knew you. You who are light. You who were sent as an angle of light after mom and dad finally got together and mom became pregnant and the chromosomes were placed in all of this kind of business, light was sent from God, an angle of light came from above, entered that fetus and entered into the fetus and then became the, uh, the, the, the angel, as you would, inside to run this body. Now the point is, it says in the Bible, before you entered here, I knew. So then there is something other than mom and dad's mistake or mom and dad's calculations going on that we have to consider as being the source, and that is that source there of light. Intelligence, light that has the capacity to change its mind, light that has the capacity to understand, light that has the capacity to communicate. And we'll, we'll get to all of these things as to how life works. We found out that the physical properties of life are totally dependent on choice, mistakes, genetics, and then the structuring of conditions. And that's what it is. Say. So now we start to say, OK, there is no way. <laughs> There's no way you're going to take a mistake. I mean, if, if mom and dad didn't want to have sex that uh, night that way, and dad was supposed to have a condom, and he forgot, and you were born, there, this is no way this thing is going to heaven. For what? Sorry. All of these mistakes are going to heaven. And we found out that all of these chromosomes and all of these genetics cause you to act the way you do. And so then if you have a bad set of chromosomes and a bad set of genetics and you act the way you do and the way you act is negative, and then who is going to send you to hell for that? Because you could have made, when you were coming down as an angel, an angle of light heading for who you are, you could have made a left turn and wound up someplace else. Let me ask you something. Here you are trying to work out your karma. So you work maybe as an engineer at the power plant. 
Or, or maybe you, you work as a, as a computer programmer. OK, so now you're going to take this back and say, oh, I'm going to come back next time and work out my karma, because I've had some problems with my employees, and I've got to learn how to work with them. And I'll work that out in the next life. Next life, you're allowed to be an Eskimo, drilling a hole looking for beavers. Seals. <laughs> so then how, how do you work this out? How do you work this out? Here I am. I'm president of Dow Chemical. And I'm going to come back. I know I've got some karmic problems. I'm going to come back in the next lap. I'm going to have to work out my karma. I know that. What's he do next time? He comes back and he's a Zulu tribe warrior in Kenya. <laughs> he's going around here and I think I forgot something. What is that? This doesn't seem right. This wasn't the way it was in New York. What the hell is going on? It's silly. <clears throat> We're going on You see, so who then? Could this be? We, we've talked about the intercourse between the male and the female and all the complexities involved in that. And we realize that you as mother and fathers create children. And the children that are created are created with your chromosomes that you got from somebody else. And you pass them on and pass them on and pass them on. And we produce all of these types of characters. And we understand that. But then we have the Bible saying that before somebody entered into this, it was known in another place beyond life. Life is a very physical thing. Physical life is a very physical thing depending on genetics and structuring of education. But there's something else. The one who was totally created by specific people and chromosomes and friends, the one who is known before came into the womb, there is something else. So we're finally arriving at this essence of who we really are. OK? You're not a mistake. Your body may be, but you're not. A mistake. And so let's look and see then, if this one said, before you were in the womb, I knew you. Somebody knew you before you entered the fetus, which grew into the physical body that you are. So who knew you? Well, the one that we are taught or teaching or considering is this entity called God. So let's look at page 995 and see what this God is. It's in a book called 1 John. And in 1 John on page 995, verse 1 and chapter 5, it's a verse, chapter 5, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. Five. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. All right. So light said, before you entered in to the womb, I knew you. Light knew light. All right? He didn't know you. <laughs> before you were formed in the fetus as a body. Because remember, we found out in a particular case that we had that a condom was supposed to be used that night. Dad forgot it, and so you wound up as an accident because he didn't go to the drugstore. God didn't know that person, but God knew after the accident occurred, God knew the photon that was dispatched to live in that fetus. God knew who that was, and that was light. All right? Now, so we enter the fetus via the pineal gland of the brain as light, we must be because light said that light knew us before we entered. Well, look at page 878 and look at John. In the book of John, look at John chapter 12. And in John chapter 12, in verse 36, it says, while you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of the light. Aha! So now I realize, you and I realize, that we are not the children of our parents who were 
having an affair or whatever they were doing. We're not the children of that at all. The body is the children of them. But we understand that we are the children of the light. And so as the children of the light, we enter in to this body and are encased in the center of the brain. And then our job is to somehow conquer all of the misinformation, all of the violent traditions, all of the screaming and yelling because that happened because of the fall. Now, what was the fall? Why does this happen? Anyhow, why couldn't the light just come in and we all have a good time? You know, we're going out on the ocean and we're sailing, sailing, and we're doing all these. Why, why isn't it just fun? Because it says in the very Bible that there was a time eons ago when the sons of God intercoursed with the daughters of men. Well, that means that when the light entered in to the physical body to begin this fun time on earth that we were supposed to have, something developed with the physical body itself with the desires to do other than what we should have been doing started to grow and grow and grow and eventually overwhelmed that which was the angle of light. In other words, the light inside was overwhelmed by all of this that was surrounding it and it got stronger and stronger and stronger. And it has reached the point now where the only thing that can overcome it is a combination of what we're talking about and the power that's coming down from the planets today and the discoveries and what's going to happen between now and 2000. So here you are as light in the middle of all of this chaos with one purpose to be here, to break the tradition, to break down all of the all of the misunderstandings to break down all, and even, even in New Age. I mean, New Age and fundamentalism are exactly the same. They're totally concentrated on one thing, the self. <laughs> the self is a mistake. I'm going to show you that. Now, look at one other scripture about that, and then we'll, we'll leave that. We'll go to page 962. And on page 962, you come to a book that uh, is called the book of Colossians. And in the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Light. All right? Now, you you're might be sitting here having a little problem because you've got feet and you've got hands and you've got eyes and you've got a nose and you've got feelings and you get sick and you get well and all this. And all of a sudden, start, people start talking to you about being in light. And we'll clarify that for you so that you'll understand that. Right now, it's difficult for you to understand how you could be light, but just deal with that. Uh, there is a structure inside of you. There are billions and billions of little subatomic structures that together make up what you are physically. And you are one of those parts of the subatomic. And we'll talk about that. But let's not worry about it. Now. We are light. Light that is alive within the center of the brain, surrounded by all the genetics and all the rest of the stuff that exists as objects to bring you down. Everything that is part of you that you are trying to save will bring you down, will destroy you, everything. You'll get 70, 80 years if you're lucky. Some, some of us, like the kid that Jackson got 15 years, 11 years. Some of us very, very young. And, but the best we can make out of this is maybe 80, 85 years. And at that point, it's not so much fun anyhow. Because everything is constantly degenerating and, it gonna, and it's struggling to bring you down. And most of us go along with it. And we fight it. We go to the doctor and we take pills. And Joan's got every herb and every, every uh, piece of grass that was ever uh, pulled out of the thing stacked up and she takes all this stuff. And that's fun and that's okay. And I, mean, you know, I, I don't have any problem with that. But you lose. I read the book at the end and we lose. Because we're, we're not concentrating on who we are. We're concentrating on who our parents gave to the earth as the children of earth instead of understanding ourselves as the children of light. We're concentrating on that. And that's, that's the karmic problem. Last week, Don Dowd made an interesting comment about the light that is dispatched in a negative state by execution. 
So, okay, you have, you're in this body for however long you're here until you, off you go. And uh, you will then return as an angle of light into another body. And you will bring with you as an angle of light those things that you have accomplished, those positive things that you have accomplished in your uh, assignment from God, which is to break down the kings of the earth so that the earth can be a happy and fun place for all, including the animals in nature, instead of the way it is now. So you're bringing that all back with you, but that's because you've had an opportunity. You've lived long enough to where you could start to become enlightened. You're into the Aquarian age, you're starting to understand it, you're starting to understand about nature, you're starting to understand how all of these things work. So now you're in a situation, okay, where when you do come back as light, you'll start to bring some positive things back and start to be much stronger in overcoming the screaming and all of the other things that go on inside of our mind. But what about the person and Don, I think, raised this, and it was a good point. This person who is uh, dispatched by us as a raving, mad person filled with violence and rage and hate has totally overwhelmed the light. The Jeffrey Dahmers of the world and the other rapists and serial killers that do all of these terrible things, and the system executes them. Off they go shooting out at 186,400 miles per second, a fallen angel filled with rage. And this light is going to go to the water, gain molecular strength, be hit by photon, driven back into another fetus, and here we go again. I said, gee, you know, what happened? Let me show you. If you look at uh, uh, page 949, and on page 949, you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it's a one-sentence explanation for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, page 949, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, an angle of light. Back he comes. And basically what's being said here is that with this evil, once society protects itself from this evil, it has to work with this evil. It has to break this evil. It has to cleanse this evil. It has to break down all of the thought patterns in the mind of this person before that person is dispatched. Because if not, it's going to take out through the pineal gland into that realm of light. All of that which is upon its back, it's going to then come back and bingo, we got it all over again. Jesus talked about it. says when an evil spirit goes out of a person, it seeks dry land. Because out of the water seeks dry land because it wants to return to the earth. And then it comes back and it's seven times worse for that person than it was the first time meaning life. Satan is simply a fallen angle. Angle. Angel. And what does that mean? An angle of light that has fallen under the power of the mind. And we've all done that. We've all succumbed to the power of the mind. Thank God that we're starting to understand that we have to shut this mind down and we have to listen to the still small voice. We have to have directions from light. We have to be receptors of light in order to break this thing. So, and what we have to break is one of the most misunderstood things today in the circles of what we call new age or old age, whatever you want to call it. And it's called karma. I made a joke about it, but basically it's um, thought about this way, where I remember I said, you know, oh, well, I, I have bad karma. I, was hooked on cigarettes, so you know, I'm going to come back as an ashtray. Well, maybe that's silly, but we think about this in the same way. Okay. Your, I, your, your job is to break down this karma, but not the karma that you've been taught by the people of, of the East. That's not what karma is. Karma is not that I did all of these scuzzy things, so now I'm going to have to come back the next time and work it out. You didn't do anything. You acted out all of the things that were put into you by all of the crazy people who came before and are part of your family. Grandpa and grandma, all the rest of them. 
But you've got to break, what we have to break is the illusion of self. What has ever been, what has, good is it? This is the entire basis of Christianity. Christian fundamentalism is, you are going to get saved. That's it. But there's a God somewhere that says, I really don't care. What's he going to get saved from? What I'm concerned about is not that you change from this direction and go in this direction. What I'm concerned about is that the earth changes from this direction and goes in that direction. So you're saved and everybody else is running around chopping each other's heads off and doing all the terrible things. This is basically one of the most important things to break is this infatuation with self. This does not count. Self does not count. Self becomes part of the whole. Self becomes part of the joy. Once the earth, once this earth that we're given to is changed, then all selves take part in the fun. All selves take part in the joy. You can become, you can break all the karma, you can stop smoking, you can stop being nasty, you can stop doing all of these things. But if you live, as I've said many times, at a Fort Dix and the rifle range, it doesn't make any difference how nice you are, how wonderful you are, how spiritual you are. Every time you stick your head out of the door, you're going to get it blown off because there's people shooting bullets around you. What good is it if you're wonderful and everybody else is having all of these problems and doing all of these terrible things? You're surrounded by it. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to live a good life. I'm trying to do all the nice things. And yet, yes? No, I have to say something. No, okay. That. Okay, sure. And, and along with this article that had a do in Discovery Magazine about genes and genetics, they said that a child who grows up in a dysfunctional home where there's a lot of fighting and screaming such as you, their body sometimes, the fight or flight syndrome in their body never gets turned off. Very good. Interesting never gets turned off they're, because they're constantly waiting for another situation to happen and their body is, their, and their mind it's is, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? And that fight or flight syndrome is in a constant mode of go. Okay. And, and obviously, probably, that being an unnatural situation will then also impact on the health of the person. The immune system. Yeah, in the immune system. So in Isaiah 58, 6, it says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? That you break every yoke. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. See? And that's what existentialism, and we talked about that a few weeks ago. Existentialism says it's impossible. It is impossible to function on the planet Earth because we have to make all of these decisions and you have to choose what is right, what is wrong. What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Should I do this? Shouldn't I do that? Should I buy this? Is this the right decision we should make? I don't think so. Yes, you should. No, I shouldn't. What am I going to do? I don't know. Try it again. Okay, tomorrow. No, we better do it today. I think I'll do it next week because I can't. I don't know. Goodbye. Bang! Why? Because no matter what decision you make, it depends on your clans discernment. Your clan says, uh, you're the Jewish clan. The Jewish clan says, it's okay, do it. There's nothing wrong with that. The Catholic clan says, you shouldn't do that. And the Protestant clan says, you shouldn't do that. You should do it the way we do it. Who, who knows? Because there's not, you're going 65, 70 miles an hour in the parkway, the policeman comes. You violated the law. I'm giving you a ticket. You're going 120 miles an hour on the Autobahn in Germany. A guy's passing you. <laughs> Whose rules are you following? Somebody marries two people, oh, it's bigamy, put him in jail. You go to some places in Africa, the guy's got 30 of them. Eh, this is good, you're, you're doing good. See, so there's no rules, there's no rules for anybody to follow because we're not following a cosmic law, we're following laws that are fashioned by ourselves. See, the Bhagavad Gita that we taught upon some time ago said here, um, the word karma means action. It is the active principle. It is the total universe in action. There is a God. God that dwells in the universe is, looks down upon the earth and sees the wars and the rapes and the pillaging and the abuse of children and the abuse of women and the abuse of animals and says, this has got to be broken. But all the individuals down here are concerned about is their self. I've got to come back and relive so I can straighten myself out. No, you've got to come back and relive so you can straighten the earth out. You're, it is the change of the earth that is the karmic problem. 
As long as we think that we're separate from the environment, that's an illusion. As long as you think you can act separately, you can in act independently. If you are made up of chromosomes and, and you're not even responsible for all the stuff that you're doing, then what karma do you have to work out? Look, here you are. Look, here you are. Here you are. 23 chromosomes from dad, 23 chromosomes from mom, and here you are, and you got all these problems. And somebody's teaching you, you're going to have to come back, Gloria, and work your karma out. But what happens? Gloria comes back. But she's not with the chromosomes of dear old mom and dad. She's got a whole new set of chromosomes. And they don't have the same problems that she had the first time that she came back. It's all worked out for her. She's not the same way. Because she's not with the same clan. She's not with the same group. She doesn't think the same. She doesn't feel the same. That's not what God is concerned about. The only thing that you've had trouble with is overcoming all of the thoughts and all of the chromosomal activity that was given to you. That's the problem. You succumb to it. Okay, you come back the next time a little stronger, and then you'll overcome it. Eventually, you'll overcome it. And once you've overcome yours, everybody has overcome theirs. Finally, when that universal earthly karma has been broken, then that which is accomplished is the restoration of this place to a heavenly environment, which is God which is God. What is the sense of somebody dying and going to heaven? Who is going to go there? For what? Why would you go? Because you happened to make a left turn as an angle of light and wound up in a, in a fetus where uh, 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 Mother Teresa was, uh, was in charge of the family. What is this? Naturally, you're going to be good. My mom is Mother Teresa. She was Mother Teresa in her first life. I am good. I touch, I hear, I'll give you whatever you want, you know, I got money, whatever, because I am good. Great! This other guy, he shoots past you, winds up in a car where his mother's body, mother and father are Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> I don't know. Pa, Mom, <laughs> how am I doing? Now you're quick on the draw. Yeah. Yeah, fastest draw in the West, Mom. Want to see it? Want to see it again? Oh, God. Well, what happens to this? One guy's got Mother Teresa for a mother, the other's got Bonnie and Clyde. I think that might be a little unfair. <laughs> See? Of course, it has nothing to do with this. Bonnie and Clyde and all. See, the point is, Mother Teresa, oh, isn't this wonderful? She took care of all the poor people. This is the problem. The problem is the sin is that there are poor people. Why are there poor people? Because the karma of the earth is bad. You don't have to change your karma so you care more about the poor. The earth's karma has to be changed so there is no poor. Is this wonderful? You take sick people out of the streets? Is that following me? No. Okay. It's wonderful we take sick people out of the streets? No, it's horrible. Because there should be no sick people on the streets. You see? So do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? Forget about your individual karma. Your individual karma will be taken care of because when you come back as light, you're going to come back in a completely different environment, in a new body, a new set of chromosomes, and a whole new challenge. Seeing life through a whole new thing. But what is your job? To break the karma. Whose karma? The karma of the earth. That karma of the earth, which has, been, which has been so destructive. This is what God wants. God wants this karma of the earth to be changed. So when you said, and when you do that, a lot of other people get, have their karma changed too. Is that resurrection? Whatever religious word that we want to use for it is fine. We can call it resurrection, we can call it ascension, we can call it incarnation, call it whatever you want. Basically, it's a very practical thing, and that is that the mind which has been uh, demolished by the uh, entry of all of these various traditional factors is now restored to its pristine state by a cleansing. And the cleansing comes not because of any hocus pocus, but because you came, you sat down, and you said, hey, I've got to stop listening to the church, to the school, to the government, to the traditions, to the family, and I've got to shut all of this down, at least for one still small moment, and I've got to listen to the still small voice of 
my father and my mother who are light because I am light. When you start to listen to the light, then it starts to break down all of this stuff. Bill, yes? Wouldn't that be more of a condition of collective consciousness? It can only be collective consciousness when everybody eventually, individually, finds this. I don't really believe that there's an opportunity for us as individuals to make this manifest collectively. I believe that what's going to happen collectively, and I think the point is well taken, that the collective consciousness will start to be impacted by the activity of the planets between now and 2000. I think that's what this alignment of planets and the discovery of planets is showing us, and that there is a tremendous energy of light about to descend on the Earth from the nebulae, the single eye, which is going to have this effect on the mind. But those of you who are sent ahead of this are exactly like the people in the Bible who are sent to out the, uh, the city. And those who are like Aaron went with the neighbors to scout the, the promised land. And when they got there, they said, hey, you know, I think we can, we can handle this. Everything's going to be fine. There was some who were afraid of it. You are a few of the scouts who are not afraid of it and are ready to go. Because when this happens, there's going to be a lot of confusion out here. So the collective consciousness that Mike's talking about will certainly kick in. How come? Because the angles of light will come at such an extent that people will just start thinking differently. They won't be satisfied with these types of things. But basically... What about the people taking over? The power is going to be with the people rather than with cis, with the institutions. Well, yeah, yeah, well I mean, that I think we have, to, we have to kind of stand back because when you see... Uh, the type of formation of socialization that will occur in the kingdom of light. It's something like you've never even considered before. I mean, you're still thinking on the basis of socialization in the realm of what we know socialization to be. That will not be the socialization in this new realm of light. I mean, you, you have to think on a different principle Is than what we thought. Is on the world in a, in a way that things are going to get better? Is that the... Well, to, 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 to us who are coming from the light, things are going to get much better. But to those who are in the competitive stage, I mean, you know, we found out now, I mean, just to give you an idea that there are people in corporate America who would uh, uh, let tainted meat go out to make a buck. I mean, whether, whether you get sick or not is irrelevant. And so, in other words, there is a whole group that would find this restoration to nature and restoration to the environment and restoration to a oneness, you know, an abhorrent thing. And, and so it can be difficult. But I think we, what we have to just concern ourselves with now is understanding light, understanding who we are, understanding who we are physically and understanding that we occupy this and what our job is and how then we, we deal with this in coming back. And I think the most important thing that we can understand, and I'll wrap it up with this, is the fact that when you return into a new body, you return into a body of a different set of parents, different set of chromosomes, which take care of all of the things that you're worrying about as far as your karma is concerned today. And then you start to move within that different structure. Now, there may be some things you'll bring back with you that are negative, which we're talking about, like the guy who uh, is executed. But in, in most cases, the majority of us are not at that extreme. And therefore, it's probably a pretty good bet that the genetic activity in the new body will be strong enough with that to overcome those things that you're bringing back with you. Uh, but, but see, that's a real personal level. And that is not the big picture. It is much better, for instance, if you're, at, uh, if you're here and God says, well, you're doing good, but you say, well, I've got karma I've got to work out, and you're right here. Now, when we talked about you live on this uh, rifle range, and bang, bang, and all the bullets are flying all over you, so that even though you're doing your meditation and everything, you're still not feeling well, because not because of you, or not because of even anything you're thinking, but because of all the thoughts and the activities that are flying around you. Well, God's purpose of this, then, is not to change you, basically, but it's to change everything around you. Okay, And so then, if that all clears up, if you think of all of the problems that you have which have caused you to be sick and caused you to be outraged and, and so forth and so on, you'll always come back to something that surrounds you. You'll always find, because remember, when you have all of this stuff going on in your head, the person sitting next to you has a whole set of uh, nightmares that are different going on in their head. And so then you multiply this by millions and millions of people. That's why Buddha said, and I'm starting to understand it better, Buddha said many years ago that even the storms of the earth are caused by the negative vibrations that go out from the minds of people. 
But the earth itself goes into, you know, a, a fit because of this. I think so, you notice that so where, where the, 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 all of the coordinates, it speaks a language to us. Where an earthquake happens. Where I understand that. I understand that. Reading it better. Yeah, I I, I understand that. Because and. I understand that. So, so, so basically then, what we need to just consider is maybe the instructions that we've listened to about karma, well-intentioned that they may have been, may have been a little too self-centered and may not have encompassed the big picture of what God is really trying to do, and that is God is really trying to change the big picture of the earth and not really concentrate on the little picture of the self. Now, not only, as I said, in New Age circles and talking about karma, has this gotten there, but in addition to that, in fundamentalism and Christianity and Islam and so forth and so on, all of it centers around the worth of the individual instead of God's concern. Because remember this, and I don't mean to keep banging the weather, but remember this, you're not part of this. You are not the person that's sitting in that chair. The person that's sitting in the chair is the creation of the kings and queens of the earth. You're not that. You are light. And once you exit, you go back into that realm, the kingdom of light. You're coming back here to break down all of this stuff so that the earth becomes this wonderful place that it should be. Too many times, I can't repeat it over and over and over again, but I couldn't repeat it enough times, that you have to take your attention away from your body and your family and your experience as a self, although you act it out, and realize the change that's going on inside of you as the light, as the child of light. And basically, when we start to understand that, we, we get to this point, and I promise you I end with this. In the Bhagavad Gita, it says, all actions take place in time by the interweaving of the forces of nature. But the man lost in delusion thinks that he is the actor. But the man who knows the relation between the forces of nature and action sees how some forces of nature work upon other forces of nature and becomes not their slave. In other words, you begin to understand that this is an action and an interaction that is extremely complex, way beyond your creating, way beyond your solving. All that's ever been asked of you as a child of light is to spend time in the light and to keep in touch with the light so that you receive divine instruction from that which we call God so that you can carry out the assignment of which you've been given. And that assignment is to break down all of these myriads of things that have caused the problems upon the face of the earth. All right? And so then basically that's who you are that's what you are now. That's who you will be. And then as this begins, and when, when you get ready to come back, because most of you are fairly young, when you get ready to come back, you're not going to come back even to an earth that's the same as you see it now, because within the next two, three years, there's going to be tremendous changes made. If you can sit there and think that you've come into this age of Aquarius and Enlightenment and see all of what Hubble's revealing to you, it's not that it's new. It's always been there. But it's your turn to learn about it. When you can say, and if you think there's no relevance between that and your existence and what's going to happen here, then you're really misleading yourself. You can sit in the Bible or you can listen to your friends or you can go to a psychiatrist or go to a doctor and you can take the word. But when you can't look and see the very signs of the times, Jesus, and Christ, Jesus Christ himself said they don't discern the signs of the times. They can say red, right, you know, they can see sun, the red sky, and they know that it's going to be a nice day or whatever, but they can't look at the very signs of the times. And the signs of the times are written in the sky. They're on the front page of uh, Time magazine. And all these things that are, Time, uh, New York Times, all of these things are happening. And when you can't take what we're talking about, you as an individual, and separate it from what's going on in the sky, because within, say, between now and the year 2000, it's going to come down on you. And it's a very, very exciting time. But it's not for you or me to, in our five senses, to try to discern how it's going to be, because it's way above that. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, and what I'm talking about right now is a realm of God control. And where there is God control, there is no trouble. So uh, let's look at that.